Hello everyone, my name is Jim Gresham and I'm a tour guide with Walks of Charleston and today we're going to be walking with travel and leisure exploring some of the beautiful alleys and hidden passages that are available here in historic Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston enjoys 350 years of history. We have the largest historic district in the country and we have more buildings of the National Historic Register than any other city in the country. First, before we get started, I want to introduce my favorite building here in the city, the Old Exchange and Provost Dungeon. This building is wildly important based on a couple of facts. Number one, it represents the very last official British building built on American soil, completed in 1771, just four years prior to the outbreak of the Revolutionary War. We're here at a location known as Philadelphia Alley. And Philadelphia Alley, I think, is probably the most picturesque of all the alleyways that we offer here in historic Charleston, South Carolina. Another name that Philadelphia Alley is known as, it went by the name of Dooler's Alley. And this is where two men would settle their differences by marching off 10 paces, turning, counting to three, and firing dueling pistols at each other in order to settle their differences. Benjamin Franklin considered dueling to be a barbaric act, and we found that dueling was largely outlawed in young America after the end of the Revolutionary War. South Carolina didn't get around to banning dueling until 1888. We're here in Unity Alley, and behind me is the old historic McCrady's Tavern. One of the features of McCrady's Tavern was the formal dining room located on the second story known as the Long Room. And the Long Room would host a beautiful banquet for a very special guest. In 1791, President George Washington came to Charleston. Here at McCrady's, a 30-course meal was offered to the president. And I can't imagine what a 30-course meal would have consisted of, but I have a feeling the president could have handled those calories. We find ourselves here on Chalmers Street, and Chalmers Street happens to be the only street in the city that's paved entirely in these English river rocks that we call ballast stones. Empty sailing ships crossing over the Atlantic needed some weight in them to maintain stability at sea. When those ships arrived, rather than taking these rocks and tossing them into the harbor, we retained them and we started to pave our streets. Located behind me is arguably the oldest house Charleston offers, the beautiful pink house from 1696. Some people argue really wasn't a house. It was actually built as a tavern, and the oldest designation of a house here in the city goes to the Dr. John Linning House from 1711. But I like to give credit where credit's due and say, pink house, you've been around for a long time. The pink house weighing in at 1,010 square feet doesn't offer a whole lot of space to enjoy, and I certainly hope that the new owner of the pink house isn't a very tall individual because the bedroom that's located on the second story has a ceiling height of five feet six inches tall. We're here on Elliott Street, and Elliott Street, one of these areas of the city where we were found during the pre-revolutionary times, our colonial period, a lot of the working class citizens of the city living. Behind me, a tenement that was owned by a gentleman named William Mills. And we don't really remember him all that well. We remember him for his son. And his son was named Robert Mills. And if you aren't familiar with Robert Mills by name, all you have to do is pull out a $10 bill, look to the back of every $10 bill, and you'll find the US Treasury Building designed and created by Charleston native and America's native architect, Robert Mills. So here at Beaton's Alley, uh, we see the tree growing into the wall. Engineers had to scratch their heads, what do we do? So they created the U to accommodate the tree and accommodate the wall. So the tree is happy, the wall is happy, and everybody's happy. Check out this Model A here. 1912 Model A, built by Henry Ford. And if you take a look at the Model A, it's got a trunk. That's how we get its name, the trunk. There's an actual trunk on the back of the car. 
We're about to enter Stoll's Alley here, and Stoll's Alley, named after the 17th century iron worker, a gentleman by the name of Justinius Stoll, Stoll's Alley is more or less known for something else. It's known as being the narrowest street, the skinniest street that Charleston offers. Stoll's Alley went by another name. It went by the name of Pilot's Alley. We're not talking about airplane pilots. We're talking about ship captains. They would use this access path to get to the waterfront so they could board their vessels and set to sea. My foot is resting upon a curious piece of stone that we see frequently lining our city streets here. On the sidewalks of our public rights of way, we have these carriage stones. And of course, yesterday, we weren't using things like Volkswagens and Jeeps to get around. We had horses and carriages as our transportation. And this would help a lady board a carriage. We're about to enter into Longitude Lane. And Longitude Lane is a curious name. This is an east-west street that's named after a north-south device. And as we get a little further into Longitude Lane, I'll explain how it came to be. What I like to see is the uh, crevices that were made through years and years of wagon traffic. You can see the indentations on these slate pavers. In the early 1700s, mariners knew how to get around using latitude, but they didn't know the mysteries of how to measure longitude. Well, it took a 1708 disaster at sea where 1,500 British sailors lost their lives, and a young clockmaker from London stepped up to the plate named William Hamilton. After several years of trial and error, in 1736 came up with a device called the Marine Chronometer, which measures distance at sea and effectively solved the question of how to measure longitude. Charleston, being a heavily influenced maritime city celebrated this discovery because they knew that their goods would be able to reach market much more efficiently. So they named this street that runs east and west after a device that goes north and south. Hence the name Longitude Lane. Well everyone, thank you very much for joining me for an exploration of these beautiful alleys and hidden passages that Charleston has to offer. Just join me the next time you come to Charleston, South Carolina. My name is Jim Gresham, and you've been walking with Walks of Charleston and Travel and Leisure.